Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today, we have entered day 141 of the ongoing war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. As I was uh, perusing uh, several articles over the past uh, a week or so, I noticed uh, one or two specific art- articles that uh, had the following headline, or roughly the following headline, that's, that stated that uh, desperate Russia now using air defense missiles against Ukrainian ground targets. And what they were talking about is the use of, uh, of the S-300 uh, air defense system against ground targets. Obviously, the S-300 is a, is a very long-range air defense missile uh, that uh, actually packs a fairly large warhead. And in all actuality, one of the uses of the S-300 is, in fact, to engage both ground and ship-borne targets, meaning uh, uh, sea-based uh, surface threats. What I can also tell you, and we, and we know this with absolute certainty, is that the United States Navy, for instance, also uses its air defense missiles uh, against uh, in a in a in, in a desperate means to fend off other navies in the world. I'm just kidding, but that's my whole point. Is the U.S. Navy uses its own standard air defense missiles, the SM-1 all the way up to SM-6 block, whatever we're using now. But uh, those systems have been used in the past to effectively hit, uh, especially in naval targets in a variety of, uh, of past conflicts. I, I know specifically during uh, Operation Praying Mantis uh, back in the late 80s, the U.S. used standard missiles to attack Iranian ships. And uh, what those standard missiles offer, as do the S-300s, are a high sonic, high speed alternative to uh, ground attack systems, standard ground attack systems that may operate a bit slower, such as the Harpoon. The Harpoon is a subsonic system, while as the standard is a is a high sonic system coming in at, at very, very high speed to uh, hit a target. So you have both kinetic energy and then you obviously have the explosive inside the warhead as well. So whatever targets the Russians were going after, in all likelihood, they wanted to hit it uh, with a very fast missile system that that the Ukrainians may have had difficulty of engaging with its own air defense system. Obviously, something coming in at very high speed and is a bit smaller is obviously a more difficult target to hit. And I, I don't believe it's a act of so-called desperation. And uh, obviously during war, things at times tend to change and new systems start to become, uh, start to be utilized, especially uh, in terms of repurposing some systems that may work better in, in uh, in an alternate manner, so to speak. And again, the case with the uh, with the S three hundred, it's difficult to ascertain what the Russians have done with the S three hundred. Have they put a new seeker system on it? Have they put a, a have they put Glosnas receivers? I, I believe they they have those anyway. But uh, it, it's it's very probable the Russians have felt a need for a a high speed uh, system that could attack ground targets and obviously the Russians have a plenty of S-300s as they, as they as they have been in production for many decades now and uh, you you have a system if it has a range of let's say 100 miles it's very fast high mock and has a 2 300 pound warhead and is able to effectively hit a small target or within 1 meter then why not use it? It seems like a very, very reasonable strategy in terms of our tactics that the Russians are employing by using the S-300. And if you think about it, maybe 
using the S300 with its smaller warhead could be more effective at reducing collateral damage instead of using a thousand pound warhead or a two thousand pound warhead maybe the S300 system and its smaller 200 pound 300 pound warhead whatever whatever there's there's a multitude of warheads and who knows what what kind they were using but very very possible that it was uh, negating collateral damage and in all probability the Ukrainians may start doing the same th thing with its own S-300s uh, if in fact they have, uh, as they continue to be destroyed by Russian forces, it could become more and more difficult and in all likelihood the Ukrainians are pro probably trying to uh, save those for use against uh, actual air targets which they were intended for. But, you know, in warfare, again, it's not uncommon for such systems to be repurposed for uh, events such as we're seeing now. So again, who knows what's, what was going on uh, in the uh, Russian battlefield commander's mind, but if it was an effective system and it worked well, then by all means they're going to use it. And again, just going back to the U.S. use of its own air defense missile systems against uh, seaborne targets, against surface threats, uh, they are very, very effective at attacking the uh, the superstructure of a of a vessel, thus uh, eliminating its uh, its its radar c capability and its ability to defend itself against uh, slower moving threats such as uh, subsonic uh, anti ship missiles. So uh, again, the U.S. could or would then strike with these standard missiles coming in at very, very high speed taking out the ship's sensor package or elements of the sensor suite designed to defend the ship, uh, designed to operate maybe air defense systems or what have you, and then launch your, uh, your dedicated, uh, slower-moving uh, harpoon missiles or whatever you're trying to use to, to then de completely destroy the vessel in question. And uh, again, it's not a, a sign of desperation. It's just... It's just, it's war, and uh, that's what you tend to see. Now, uh, looking at the, uh, the ongoing uh, conflict, we continue to see a very, very heavy use of, uh, of Russian artillery. There's, there's not been a great deal, again, changes uh, on the ground over the last uh, few days. Uh, could the Russians uh, have stalled after moving west of Lysychansk? Uh, or are the Russians preparing uh, to an attempt to encircle and, uh, and create a cauldron or pocket around Kramatorsk in Slovyansk? I think if we look back at what the Russians did, especially uh, going back to the Severodonetsk Lysychansk pocket, uh, we are now uh, starting to get information that indeed the Ukrainian withdrawal from the the Moosehead Cauldron near uh, Lysychansk and Severodonetsk. I'm going to try to get back to the Moosehead. There we go. There's the Moosehead, the Camelhead. Indeed, that uh, withdrawal was somewhat chaotic, according to anecdotal reports uh, coming out of uh, Ukraine and Ukrainian service personnel who had to retreat from Lysychansk and Severodonetsk, the Severodonetsk Lysychansk cauldron that was created by Russian forces uh, as they uh, collapsed the Ukrainian pocket in that locale. And then if we speed up, we can clearly see what happened and there is a method to the Russian madness. And there it is. Now the question is, are we going to say, see the same tactic, the same strategy being employed by Russian forces against Ukrainian forces around Kramatorsk? If you look at Russian moves in the south uh, towards uh, uh, Bakhmut and kind of directly south of, uh, of uh, Kramatorsk, and then you look at the activity that is happening uh, southwest of Izum. Uh, I, I do believe we could be watching the Russians set the stage uh, for a possible encirclement 
uh, from both the north and the south of, uh, of Kramatorsk. Now, has that happened yet? No, it hasn't. Uh, is it is it possible that is the Russian strategy at this point as, after the uh, fairly successful operation we observed uh, in and around Lysychansk? Uh, yes, I would say it is. However, it's going to be a much larger operation. Uh, the uh, defensive capacity that and buildup that has occurred uh, around uh, Slovyansk, uh, Kramatorsk, and then down towards uh, Bakhmut. Is, uh, is much more significant than the forces that were present uh, in and around Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. Obviously, uh, there was the Donets River that separated uh, Russian forces from Lysychansk, but uh, Russia did not mount major river, river crossing operations to seize control of Lysychansk. They ran along the western bank of the Donets River and the southern bank I'm sorry, the northern, northwestern bank of the Donetsk River in this location to circumvent and then uh, uh, take control of uh, Lysychansk. Uh, we have also seen over the last uh, day uh, in excess of more than 30 uh, Russian airstrikes on targets throughout Ukraine as well as continued use of Iskander and uh, other uh, cruise missile systems against Ukrainian targets and some of those targets have been very very deep inside of Ukraine indeed over the last uh, uh, day or so. We know that there was a strike in this vicinity here that uh, reportedly has uh, caused uh, several casualties inside the uh, city itself reported by Ukrainian authorities. But uh, that is it pretty much for Today, we will continue to monitor the situation, report, and uh, bring you more content for your consumption. Again, greatly appreciate everyone joining us. Love the comments in the comment section. If I don't respond to a comment, I apologize. I try to respond to uh, as, uh, as many as I can, and, uh, and, and ob obviously, uh, I, I do have... Uh, both a career and life outside of creating YouTube videos. But again, uh, more to come very, very soon. Again, uh, your uh, participation and comments is much appreciated. Uh, whether you uh, support what I'm saying or do not support what I'm saying, I, I don't really delete any comments uh, at all uh, unless it's just completely off the chart and, and stupid. Uh, then you know maybe but other than that uh, I, I would assume anything that that is deleted could be being deleted by YouTube I don't know um, but uh, I don't tr usually delete I mean very very rarely do I delete a comment maybe once every few weeks maybe but that's about it or if you're going to post some sort of advertisement for uh, some sort of sex site or something like that, then yeah, I'll delete that. But other than that, no. Anyway, that's it. Have a great day. We'll talk again soon.